Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual planning series on local government law. My name is Ryan Dividock. I'm the supervisor for the Planning, Zoning, and Land Use Unit here in Oakland County. The trainings today are, are well, the trainings over the sessions are, are intended to provide a concise over, overview of the legal aspects of being a local elected or appointed government official. The sessions are based on, on chapters from the book, Local Government Law, a practical guidebook for public officials on city councils, community boards, and planning commissions. And it's authored by our presenter, Jerry Fisher. Jerry's a well-known and respected land use attorney with decades of experience working throughout Southeast Michigan. Before we get started, I just want to remind folks the session's being recorded. And also, uh, I'd like you to direct your questions using the, the chat function in Zoom. Uh, direct your questions to Jim Schaefer. Jim will moderate a question and answer period after the presentation. So let's get started. Please uh, help me in welcoming Jerry Fisher. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate everybody uh, joining me for lunch and uh, a thousand hellos to all of you. So this is a presentation based on a book that uh, I had the opportunity to put together uh, a year or so ago and for the benefit of officials rather than for judges and attorneys. Uh, although uh, it, it indirectly could benefit judges and attorneys uh, because it provides a, a broader, uh, less uh, intensely uh, uh, documented uh, presentation of, of uh, legal things that, that uh, would affect many communities throughout the uh, state. Uh, today, we, uh, we have a couple of sessions for you, or sub-sessions, uh, and we're, we start with uh, the tools for financing local government. Uh, obviously, an important thing to, uh, to do, and I think that this session, uh, as well as the second session, will provide some uh, uh, interesting practical uh, uh, subject matter for you. And uh, I know everybody's familiar, generally speaking, with the finance and, and also with uh, intergovernmental agreements and so forth. But there are some things that that uh, hopefully I can offer that that uh, you'll say, boy, am I glad I'm here. Uh, so let's start with the tools for financing local government. Um, the big picture of this is that um, uh, basic products and services of local government are needed by uh, members of the public every day, uh, police, fire, emergency response, et cetera, all of these things. And uh, so today's session is how are we going to pay for uh, all of these kinds of things, um, uh, in addition to financing the day-to-day -day operations of the government itself. Uh, one good thing for local governments is that uh, they have a, an important tool uh, at their disposal for raising money uh, for taxes, assessments, and similar type revenues. They can compel payment just as a matter of law. Uh, if people don't pay their taxes, they can foreclose on the property. Uh, if they don't pay fees, they don't get a permit and things of that nature. So they've got a much stronger position uh, and, and do a little bit less of going into debt or having bad debts and so forth. Uh, but that special power uh, is associated then with an unavoidable obligation, namely the constitutional protections that apply to government uh, in these kinds of matters. Due process, for example, the government has got to give fair notice, uh, afford hearing requirements in connection with uh, uh, contested matters and and you'll find uh, if you read cases uh, on uh, taxation in many instances, these constitutional uh, protections become the issues uh, involved. Now, let's look at the oldest and largest revenue source for local government, the good old general property tax. Uh, and this is a, you know, there's a, there's a large segment of the Michigan compiled laws that that apply to general property taxation. They're, they're lengthy, they've been amended 10,000 times and not always uh, uh, with great uh, 
a, a great uh, finesse and all that kind of thing. So it's sometimes difficult to read. <clears throat> but there are a few uh, uh, indispensable steps that will apply in, in fully understanding <clears throat> general property taxation. And an early and key step in this process is assessing the value of property, uh, the individual properties. Uh, and the value of, of these properties is important. Why is that? Why is that necessary to assess these properties? <clears throat> because the amount of tax that a local government or county government and uh, uh, other authorities can collect under general property taxes is based upon the value of that property. Uh, and that's why it has always been known as an ad valorem tax. So it's a tax according to value. So if value is so important, we should take a quick look at clarifying the meaning of this term value, particularly since there are various types of value uh, in this context. Probably the most uh, fundamental would be the fair market value of property. Uh, in the uh, General Property Tax Act, they don't refer to fair market value, they refer to true cash value, and they call that the usual selling price of the property that's being assessed. Now, fair market value has some pretty fancy definitions and so forth that, that appraisers, like private property appraisers use, uh, and uh, but the usual selling price, true cash value is a little bit more down to earth for assessors and individuals being assessed so that they have a good handle on what that means. Another important value is capped value. So capped value is a constitutional limitation in Michigan, and it limits an individual's uh, value for taxation purposes uh, uh, in the uh, uh, to increasing the tax each year uh, to the limit of the consumer price index called the CPI, of course, or five percent, whichever is less uh, under uh, uh, in a particular year. Uh, and so, if if the assessed value and we'll, the, which is the next one, is 50% of true cash value, the assessed value. So if the assessor goes out and assesses, determines the true cash value, uh, and then you take 50% of that as the assessed value, uh, that is not going to be, in all cases, the in Michigan, uh, it's not going to be the uh, basis for computing the tax because the limitation in the year will be restricted by this uh, 5% or CPI. Uh, and that is a, a pretty uh, important situation. Notice that there is no restriction on the reduction in value. So if there's a horrible year and value goes down, it just drops like you know an elevator out of control and goes right down. And then it takes a number of years to get back up when the economy uh, recovers. So, so then we have, so we've got the assessed value and that is capped on some properties. You look at your tax bill and the tax bill is gonna show the assessed value and then it'll show uh, a taxable value. And the taxable value again is gonna be the lower of the assessed value and that will be as equalized by the county and state. What does that mean? Uh, so the county and state uh, uh, do their studies and get their information and make sure that the 50% of value is a, is a legitimate number. And, uh, uh, and so it's the less, lesser of uh, that assessed value at 50% and the capped value. So at that point, then, uh, you will look at the capped value, and, and that's going to be the upper limit of, of how the tax is uh, computed, uh, subject to another uh, exemption that we're going to talk about in one second. I just wanted to bring your attention that um, 
if you want to know more details on this valuation issue and many other things for assessing, there's a, a state publication, the State Tax Commission Guide to Basic Assessing, and that's online, and, and that can be uh, pretty helpful. So calculating the property tax, uh, you've got to reduce the taxable value in, uh, in, based upon uh, various kinds of exemptions that, that exist. Uh, one of the most popular exemptions is the principal residence exemption. So that's a PRE, often known, uh, which exempts a person's principal residence from school taxes up to 18 mils. So up to 18 mils, that's knocked off. And that's, again, under the constitutional uh, limitation established under the Proposition A. Uh, and so in computing the tax, then you, you take the assessed value, reduce that to the capped value. Uh, and then if it's a principal residence, you exempt 18 mils. And then it's, it's uh, uh, multiplied times the tax rate to get the actual tax. So all of this subject is directly related to local government budgeting. So how is the budget set? Obviously, um, uh, at a local government, the, the uh, administrative officer is going to put together uh, the budget uh, and work with all the department heads and, and others to determine how much money is needed. Uh, and then the uh, next step is going to be, to well, let's see now, how much tax do we have authorized? How much can we levy uh, in this year? Uh, and uh, and the the determination might may might be made by the legislative body to levy the entire amount of tax that's permitted in order to achieve the money needed for the local budget. On the other hand, if the budget is uh, lower uh, uh, than um, than the than the, all of the tax that is uh, that would be uh, collected based upon the, the amount of uh, tax that is authorized, the local government may choose to levy less than what is authorized. And that happens, uh, uh, oddly enough, with some frequency. And, um, and so that's how, how that works out. Uh, the next uh, step that we wanna look at on this next slide is collecting the property tax. Uh, and again, this is where local governments are are uh, in good shape, and the ultimate collection tools are huge uh, interest in pe penalties if you don't pay on time. So that motivates a lot of people to get their taxes paid. So they don't pay those penalties, uh, and they pay a penalty as soon as the taxes are are overdue, uh, and it's still at the local government. Then the local government sends their delinquent taxes to the county, and then another, more penalties are imposed. Uh, and if none of that works out, then the government can uh, go through a process and actually sell the property for the taxes. Now, there's some recent cases out that are very interesting, including, I think, uh, a more recent case from the U.S. Supreme Court. But there have been, a, been cases in the Michigan Supreme Court on this very subject, too, is that uh, uh, let's let's say um, the the uh, local government sells uh, the county sells the pro county sells the property uh, for um, for uh, thirty thousand dollars. The taxes owed are ten thousand dollars. Who gets the extra twenty thousand dollars? Now, in the past, governments have have uh, retained that uh, money, uh, and the courts say no more, no more. If if uh, the the values there in the property. The government has the tax sale in order to collect the taxes, not to make money, and therefore any excess amount needs to go back to the uh, property owner. Okay, uh, the next form of, of uh, revenue that I think is, is pretty important and comes up in many, many communities are special assessments. Now, the first thing to understand is that special assessment is not a tax, and it and certainly not an ad valorem tax because special assessments aren't deter aren't aren't uh, valued. The, the amount collected isn't isn't based on 
the value of the property. Uh, this this is a, a financing mechanism for funding public improvement projects uh, and, and in some cases services uh, that uniquely and specially benefit particular properties and districts within the community. So uh, if a public improvement project will benefit, uh, provide special benefits to properties in a defined district uh, within the community, a special assessment may be imposed in relation to each property in the district to provide funding for the project. Now, there's a, there's a process that goes forward, usually like 51% of the property owners sign on that, yes, we're interested in paving our roads or putting in a water line or something to that effect. Uh, and, uh, and then, the, and then here, uh, here, uh, one, at least one public hearing will be conducted uh, and uh, in the individual assessments will be uh, determined uh, on a property by property basis, at least theoretically. Um, and uh, now one thing to, to bear in mind is that uh, local governments can't assess for just anything. They must be authorized to uh, do special assessments for particular purposes. Now in townships and counties, that is general law counties, the, uh, the purposes for which assessments can be created, special assessments, uh, will be specified by, by the statute. Uh, in cities and villages and in charter counties, uh, the uh, uh, purposes for assessing would be in the charter itself, the, the city charter, village charter, et cetera. So what kind of improvements are typically done here? Uh, uh, very frequently and, and by far the, the most frequent would be streets, roads, sidewalks, and utility systems. Just a garden variety. These are garden variety special assessments. Uh, let's say it's in a subdivision. So the special assessment district is probably going to be in the subdivision to pave the streets or improve the streets uh, in that subdivision, put in a water line serving the subdivision and so forth. Now, as I mentioned, in order to uh, be legitimately able to do a special assessment or to assess a particular property, uh, there must be a special benefit. And that's as opposed to a general benefit. Uh, and the difference between the two is that the special benefit uniquely and specially applies to the particular properties in the district, even though there may be some general benefit outside the district, you know, a general uh, enhancement of, of marketability or whatever, that would not count for a special a benefit in and of itself. Um, so what does count for a special benefit uh, under Michigan law? It's pretty clear. Uh, and that is that in order to have a special benefit and the extent of a special benefit uh, is based upon and only an increase in market value. So properties have to increase in value. So what that means as compared to just being taxed for in general, uh, for operating the government uh, under the General Property Tax Act, for special assessments, theoretically, the property is enhanced uh, in, in market value, and that's the extent to which the local government can uh, impose a special assessment. So the theory is that people aren't paying out of pocket, so to speak, for a project that will they'll never recover for, when the project's over, uh, the uh, property value will increase uh, in proportion, uh, and and hopefully to the extent of the um, of the value increase from the project. Now, how does the government uh, say the government is going to pave a road? A road contractor is not going to take installments over ten years, and so what happens is. Uh, it's necessary for the local government to uh, put together the money uh, to make the upfront payment to the contractor to do the project. Uh, and the most common source of, uh, of that upfront money is for the government, local government, uh, 
either on its own uh, or combined with other governments or maybe working through the counties uh, of bor borrowing strength uh, to uh, issue bonds to members of the public. And so you have bond purchasers, they put in their money and that's like a loan given to the local government doing the project. Local government repays the loan over uh, 10 years or whatever the life of the project is, uh, repays the loan plus interest from the annual installments collected from the properties that are special assessed. So that's the by far, in a way, uh, the uh, most common source of the upfront money. There are some communities uh, that have uh, put together enough money in a separate fund, typically, like a sinking fund, they often call it, uh, so that the, that the government can loan the money uh, to the, uh, or pay the money to the contractor uh, and collect the money back over a period of years with interest. So uh, in some instances, the government's interest is, is sufficient to they, so that they actually make uh, they might make some money and, and create a larger and larger pool uh, of money, which is a very smart thing because uh, this, this uh, gives the, the government the opportunity to, to do these projects, put more money into the project itself, because in that case, then they're not spending uh, the significant money it takes to sell bonds and all of that uh, process. Okay, uh, the next a form of significant financing for local government would be special taxation for dedicated purposes. So, uh, so in addition to the general property taxation, local governments can collect special taxes. Uh, and this is generally referred to as uh, where the local government goes out for a millage uh, to undertake a project. Uh, and so generally speaking, unless there's some special authority to do otherwise. This is a millage that would be collected uh, community-wide. Uh, and, uh, and then the, the revenue collected uh, can be utilized for a special project. Uh, examples would be uh, a new municipal building or a new sewer and water treatment facility. And that, so the government, again, can issue bonds to pay the upfront money and then collect the taxation over a period of years. Now, bondholders love this kind of taxation because you don't have to worry about when it, whether people are gonna pay it as much as you do perhaps with a special assessment. People might challenge it and all that sort of thing. So when you have a special taxation, it's like almost a guaranteed source of revenue and, uh, uh, and so bondholders uh, find this to be a nice, safe investment. And, uh, and so that's an that's a easy one, a good one. Uh, other use of the money would be providing a service. So you might have a police millage, you might have a fire millage, uh, and that would go on for a period of years uh, to uh, uh, pay for police and fire of the annual contracts or, or whatever you have for your uh, 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 in-house group or uh, for a contract, say, with the county. Now, another possibility would be to do a joint project with one or more other communities. And the, one of the one of the common ones, and and this is occurring in uh, in Oakland County right now, is a joint project with with the communities throughout the county. In this particular case, throughout the uh, county. Uh, for regional transportation. And now, uh, in the past, uh, communities that weren't benefited by this had the opportunity to opt out in Oakland County, but for the last uh, millage election, uh, the opt out wasn't an opportunity, so people had to vote, and uh, the county had to rely on getting enough votes from uh, communities that felt that they were going to be benefited sufficiently. But that's another uh, use of uh, of uh, of a special taxation rather than part of the general property tax. Another great source uh, is um, uh, regulatory fees. 
Uh, and these are fees that uh, may be collected to finance particular government services or facilities. Again, op uh, examples of this would be uh, operating a building department or uh, construction and operation of a municipal uh, sewer or water system. This, you know, based upon the collection of rates and charges uh, by the local government for providing the, the particular utility. Uh, and in these situations, again, uh, this is like a self-supporting, or can be a self-supporting enterprise, and often the monies collected are, uh, are called an like an enterprise fund, uh, where the monies come in uh, that are charged um, uh, go to uh, strictly, strictly uh, to uh, paying for. Uh, the building department or the sewer or water system uh, in the in the local government, uh, and once again, uh, this flow of of uh, fee revenue can be used to support a bond issue. So, if you're going to build a new sewer system uh, and you have a, a pro forma uh, cash flow arrangement, uh, it might might support a bond issue. Now. Please keep in mind that one of the one of the really important limitations on the use of fees is going to be the the point that you cannot uh, charge fees in an amount that is expected or reasonably expected to to produce uh, revenue substantially more than the cost of the enterprise. It's this is you know a pay as you go kind of thing, and uh, it's not a money earner. It isn't. It can't be used to finance other uh, uh, parts of the, of the local government. You can't uh, use this to uh, uh, pay a city manager and things like that. This is at least not the whole thing. Uh, this is this is strictly for paying for the enterprise. Another another caution here is that there uh, is a whole body of of law uh, that has developed on on whether or not uh, the charging of fees is actually a tax. And in Michigan, as you know, uh, in order to charge a special millage, the people have to approve it. And so uh, this is a case that started in, in Lansing, where the Lansing financed a, um, a, a, a water, wastewater, not a, a drainage water system and set up a, a schedule of fees that would be paid. Uh, and uh, that was challenged on the ground that, that no, these weren't really fees. These were mandatory taxes that you were charging and it was never approved by the government. So that is, um, is, is a, 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 situ a, a basis for challenging fees. You have to be very careful and get uh, careful legal advice uh, on that. All right. Let's go to uh, the second part of this session, uh, interlocal agreements. Uh, and uh, there are, this is, these are really very important tools that I wanna talk about here. And I wanna give you a couple of cautions as a practical matter that uh, are worth considering. And we'll go through the, the nature of interlocal agreements first, and then at the end, talk about some of these cautions. So general introduction. Uh, to this is um, uh, these are these agreements sometimes referred to as interlocal agreements, sometimes intergovernmental agreements, and, and maybe given other other names as well. But they're widely used throughout the state uh, of you know various types, various purposes, various arrangements, all kinds of arrangements, uh, and they really in general involve agreements by two or more local governments for the purpose of establishing cooperative uh, arrangements to provide services or facilities. Uh, and uh, those services and facilities would be managed by the particular entity uh, that is specified in the interlocal agreement. So that might involve uh, one or more entities uh, that transfer the authority for management to one of the participants in the intergovernmental uh, arrangement. So if you have a city and township, for example, maybe they will agree to let the town or let the city or the township 
uh, run the operation. Or there may be one or more entities that put together a situation where they transfer their authority, transfer the power to run the, the, the operation to a newly created authority. Uh, and this often happens with a, like a transportation authority or, or something like that to run a transportation system. Uh, or simply two communi communities uh, are, are agree that they're going to jointly fund uh, a, an operation of some sort or, or improvement, uh, like an extension of sewer service. Uh, and they don't have to jointly fund it, but they may have an agreement that uh, the city is going to run, uh, extend the sewer into the township and allow that to happen. And that would be generally by intergovernmental or interlocal agreement. So why are these uh, agreements useful? Or, you know, why do they function? What, what motivates communities to do it? There, I, from my standpoint, there are three principal reasons. One is that there's financial strength created uh, in, uh, in joining together. So you have a, a larger financial base for say issuing bonds or collecting revenues and so forth. And by joining together, you can undertake a higher cost operation, fire, police, emergency, uh, water, sewer system, uh, and so forth that um, uh, might be out of reach otherwise. Uh, the second possibility would be efficiency. And, and this isn't a, an either or, this might be all of these. Uh, there is efficiency. So if uh, like, let's say a township and a village or a, a two cities uh, get together, uh, one, one the, the village is inside the township or the, the city is inside another city, uh, they might run a joint building department, very efficient. You know, it's right there, uh, handy in the in the locale, uh, and uh, uh, they might even share ordinances that uh, that that go with this function, and um, uh, and so that that works out pretty well. And that can be parks and recreation, uh, road maintenance. Tax assessing, you might have a joint assessor do, do work. Uh, you might have a joint DPW uh, or one entity has the DPW and contracts with the other one. You know, that would be a nice use of uh, a, gain, a, a good benefit of efficiency uh, for both communities. And the third point here is demand uh, and demand from a broader area. So you let's say you have two communities and there might not be enough uh, demand uh, in each one of those communities acting alone to, to properly finance uh, a library, for example. Uh, but if they get together, there's enough of a, a base for uh, creating the demand for the system and, and financing the system. So, so you have these three things, they can operate together uh, independently or whatever, financial strength, efficiency, uh, and demand. Uh, now, uh, this is an important thing, is that um, in order to have communities participating in these, in these organizations, these local, local government, uh, intergovernmental agreements, generally speaking, generally speaking, uh, in order for one or the other communities or any of the communities to participate, each of them has to have the authority under law to operate and undertake that, that uh, duty or service on its own. So you can't have an entity that doesn't have that authority join another uh, entity and then impose a tax or a charge on its citizens and so forth if it doesn't have the, the right to do it on its own in the first place. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, what are the types of organizational structures uh, that are involved here. Uh, one of them would be a metropolitan system. So you have like in the Detroit metropolitan area, great example. Uh, that, this is something that has been an intergovernmental arrangement since uh, like a century and a half in the early 1800s 
when Detroit established the public water, its public water system. Um, uh, so Detroit has all this, this infrastructure and, and equipment and personnel, uh, and they put together the Detroit Water and Sewerage uh, Department, and they contract uh, contracted with uh, local communities in Southeast Michigan. And uh, the interesting thing is that that, that developed into one of the largest uh, metropolitan systems in the country. Uh, 126 municipalities in seven counties. Now, more recently, uh, that has been uh, uh, separated, whereas the Detroit Water and Sewage uh, takes care of Detroit. And then you have the um, Great Lakes Water Authority, GLIWA, that uh, handles the uh, governments outside of Detroit. Uh, and uh, and those those uh, outside uh, counties, for example, will have a membership on the uh, on the on the decision making board. So the counties o Oakland, Macomb, uh, and Wayne, uh, uh, and the state of Michigan will will sit on on that board. Now, so how far can can this situation go? Uh, Los Angeles County, California. In about 1960, there were 887 contracts with local governments to operate things. And, and in some cases, uh, Los Angeles County essentially operates the whole community. It's, it serves as the government entity for the whole community, which is an unusual thing. St. Louis County, Missouri, uh, 81 of the 98 municipalities use the services of the county. So that is something that... Uh, uh, is uh, obviously there must be some reason for this, some some track record of success and so forth. All right, what other kinds of uh, structures uh, would be relevant? Uh, it can have a merger concept with two or more communities combining with one of those participating entities being charged with managing the system. Uh, and so it's not uncommon to have uh, the county uh, become the service provider, and then all the other communities using the service would become rate payers and rate paying customers uh, that would uh, reimburse the county. And, and Oakland County provides some of that service. Other counties do as well. Grand Rapids, uh, very big in, in that as well. Uh, another alternative would be the creation of a new authority altogether uh and uh so you have two or more communities combining entering into this uh agreement but they don't pick one of their one of the communities to operate and maintain or manage they create a new authority for that purpose and one of the most interesting ones uh interesting arrangements that that i had some involvement in was uh where the michigan canadian government uh, put an intergovernmental agreement together for the purpose of building the Gordie Howe and operating uh, the Gordie Howe, financing and operating the, the Gordie Howe Bridge uh, between uh, Detroit and uh, Windsor. Uh, so uh, this, this kind of arrangement would also be easily applicable to uh, financing uh, interstate freeway construction or, or maintenance. Uh, another interesting intergovernmental arrangement that uh, exists is like mutual aid entities. Uh, and this really becomes an important and helpful uh, entity uh, for efficiency and effectiveness of fire departments to ensure sufficient response time uh, and, and maybe getting more than one department together to fight a large fire. Uh, maybe several departments come and fart, uh, fight a large fire, uh, and uh, and there are all kinds of arrangements that will will uh, apply here for the joint use of equipment, manpower, and so forth. So these are popular. Uh, this is a popular kind of thing, and uh, obviously results in a a benefit. Uh, another another. Uh, 
uh, thing to talk about here is what is the statutory authority for these entities? And believe me, there are many statutes, too many for us to, to talk about here, but uh, one of the uh, oldest and uh, uh, original uh, arrangements was uh, based on MCL 124.1 uh, of the Intergovernmental Contracts Between Municipal Corporations statute. And uh, so this is authorized the ownership, operation, performance uh, of all kinds of things. And uh, and this is also authority, if, if you were wondering where the authority was for this, if uh, two local governments want to um, provide service by from one of them, like a DPW, providing service outside of that community, this act is, is uh, specifically authorized that the, the uh, MCL 124.3 particularly authorizes this kind of intergovernmental agreement. Another one, major, a major statute uh, is the Urban Cooperation Act 124.501. Uh, and this gets broader and it authorizes public agencies to cooperate. So cities, villages, townships, counties, school districts, special uh, districts uh, and public authorities and it was this statute, I believe, that um, was utilized by uh, by uh, state of Michigan and uh, and the uh, and Canada to do the Gordie Howe Bridge Intergovernmental Agreement, uh, and because it, it really authorizes an international use of of these entities. And by the way, just it, I don't know if this will come up in uh, in Michigan or not, but in New York. Uh, the statutes actually authorize intergovernmental arrangements between the, the governments in New York and governments in other states. And uh, so, uh, you know, whether that's more news to come or uh, something that will be will stay in, in New York. And, you know, whatever happens to New York doesn't always stay in New York, as you know. Uh, now. There are also some, uh, there's authority, statutory authority for special purpose intergovernmental agreements. Uh, one of them uh, is utilized uh, regularly, uh, the Joint Municipal Planning Act. And uh, I'm not really doing it a, a due service by giving you this explanation of it because it's, it, it's pretty uh, widespread. So it gives authority for two or more communities to exercise planning and zoning authority with regard to uh, all or designated parts of respective communities. So you can uh, create a joint planning commission uh, and all of those kinds of things. You can you can have joint uh, zoning ordinance provisions and whatnot. So if you uh, wanna put uh, two communities together that uh, would be relevant for certain kinds of, of uh, planning and zoning, I mean, say the community has as an area that that could have um, uh, be jointly regulated for zoning purposes, this would be your your act. Uh, and another one that's used throughout the state and has been for a number of years uh, is um, an intergovernmental arrangement to avoid annexation and provide for economic development. Uh, so you know that uh, that between cities and townships, typically. Uh, the uh, city may see that the township has some uh, assets in terms of uh, land, uh, developable land, may have some, uh, maybe some, maybe even some utility uh, benefits and so forth. And the city wants to come in and annex that uh, part of uh, of a township. Now, actually, that's the way cities used to grow. Uh, that's the way Detroit grew. Uh, throughout uh, uh, history until roughly World War II and the end of World War II. Uh, we saw a lot of that. Uh, the city of Pontiac did a lot of annexation. annexing. Uh, the uh, city, the, the uh, township of, uh, what was the township? I can't remember. Became the city of Rochester Hills in order to avoid uh, being raided, so to speak, by, by outside entities. Uh, and um, and so, as opposed to going through all the fighting for annexation, this statute provides a good opportunity for two government entities 
to negotiate a resolution and to share all kinds of things, including sharing taxation, sharing zoning, other ordinance regulation, and so forth, and other controls. Uh, so in other words, uh, if a city is providing certain certain benefits, they can the township can agree that the city can collect some of their taxes uh, or be entitled to some of their taxes in, in the township in order to provide functions. So it's a pretty good uh, arrangement be entered into for 50 years uh, and and it can be extended for another 50 years. Um, and so there aren't many of us that live longer than 100 years. So this is probably going to go on for the life of uh, most people involved. And one of the important things here is if you enter into this kind of agreement, annexation is not permitted during the period of the agreement between those entities. So it's a good defense, it's a good offense, but more than anything else, it allows a sensible way to negotiate something so that both parties end up benefiting and avoiding a long-term uh, fight. So what happens at the end of the 100 years or whatever the thing is, uh, I think the, the garden variety uh, agreement has the city act, actually become, you know, taking over the property. It becomes an actual physical annexation of the property to the city, but that's not required. The, it, basically, it's whatever the agreement specifies. So that, that can be part of the negotiation. Now, uh, we've talked about the, the benefit of these agreements, but let's let's take a quick look. Our, our time is waning here. Let's take a quick look at some of the some of the provisions that you should be looking for and understanding uh, when you're forming a, a, an intergovernmental agreement or where the community is considering becoming a part of it. So you know who are the parties? Uh, what are the purposes? Assets? Uh, planned construction, proposed operation, who's going to do all those things, when is it going to happen, what's the financing scheme, how much does the local government have to contribute now and later, when's the money due, um, ongoing responsibilities of each participating party down the road, uh, who are the customers, and here's an important one, are the customers all treated on equal terms, because an agreement can specify uh, otherwise, if uh, if one one government happens to have greater strength, uh, how are fees charged? Uh, uh, how is how are they determined? Uh, what's the maximum duration of the intergovernmental agreement, including any extensions? Uh, how are uh, assets distributed when the whole thing terminates? Uh, what voice or, or participation authority does each local government have uh, so that they can properly represent their local community? Uh, and then, of course, uh, is there adequate insurance covering each participating member and their officials? So all, all important items, all things to be aware of, all things to uh, think about. Now, I said at the beginning that I was going to talk about a couple of uh, cautions that are, are relevant here. Um, so let's take a look at them. And, and they have the source as a source, uh, uh, some of the concerns in the very reason why local governments exist in the first place. Uh, so local governments take over matter, matters of local concern, uh, maintenance and they maintain governance at the local level. That has been recognized if you can get people, get the governance closest to the people, that is generally considered to be the most beneficial. So you want to keep the local government uh, close to, uh, you know, the, the people framing policy close to the people. Number two, uh, considering the size of a local government uh, and the proximity of the policymakers to the voters, we know most of the voters know uh, people running for election, uh, they know uh, who they want to elect, they know whether they think they trust them, or they have the philosophy that's the same as theirs, and they, they can hold them accountable. So, and that's uh, important. Now, so it seems like this is a no-brainer uh, 
you know, this is all beneficial and so forth. And there are some notable commentators uh, uh, on this general subject that have questioned whether the use of interlocal agreements might actually dilute or even undermine these important advantages uh, for having a local government in the first instance. So first, I'm going to, we're going to talk about two things. One, regulation close to the people. No question about it. Uh, as soon as you start increasing the size of, and population of, of the base for undertaking an activity um, in, a, in an interlocal agreement, that moves people farther away from their officials. Uh, so is that necessarily going to be a, a big enough thing that should tell you not to be involved in this project? Uh, my thought is that you know, intergovernmental agreements almost always delegate administrative authority, not legislative authority. So, so there might be an administrative authority over a particular subject that's narrow, typically, and uh, so the rest of the legislative scheme is still there, and so you still have the governance in general, and probably for the most important purposes, close to the people even though you're giving something up. So that's, you know, a trade-off that has to be determined uh, in, in, the, uh, in the overall bargain. Second, accountability to voters. Again, again uh, uh, local government officials are elected to make decisions in the interest of, of the local government and the people in that government. Uh, and there's a, no doubt about the fact that you put an intergovernmental agreement together and the ultimate uh, managing entity is going to be responsible for for benefiting the intergovernmental entity, not necessarily the individual governments in that entity. So there's a built-in potential for decisions made that happen to be in the best interest of the broader group that may actually conflict with one or more local governments in the entity. So the lesson learned here would be in evaluating and later negotiating uh, the use of uh, intergovernmental agreement. Officials should you know, weigh the potential for these, these downsides uh, in relation to what the upsides might be. Uh, and then if, if, it, if it's possible to be diligent to try to in, in incorporate provisions in the intergovernmental agreement that minimize any conflict that might occur. Those are the lessons learned. And now uh, I know that there may be questions that uh, uh, have been uh, put into the chat to for Jim Schaefer to stump the chump. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Great presentation. We do have a number of questions. Uh, first up, how or who has to prove or show that there will be an increase in the market value to do a special assessment? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that really starts with with the party that is is allocating the uh, the uh, charges to the individual properties, and by uh, by and large, that's the uh, local government assessor that uh, makes that judgment call in the first place. But then, as I mentioned, there's a public hearing that is held on the assessments that are, are proposed to be charged, and at that point, uh, individuals can object to the amount that they're being charged on the ground that you know they're not benefiting at all or they're not benefiting enough and um and that then <laughs> goes to um uh to the uh, Michigan Tax Tribunal and possibly to the Court of Appeals okay uh can a general law village uh do regulatory fees uh do you need a vote from the residents and how are those fees determined um yeah, and I you really have to study the uh, the uh, uh, General Law Village Act, uh, which can be amended, by the way. In other words, the General Law Village Act serves as like a charter, and uh, the state allows amendments of that. So uh, you have to look at those at, at that act to, to determine whether a particular purpose of regulation is included. If not, you might be, be able to try to amend it. You know that. That's amending, like amending a charter to require a vote of the people. But um, 
if, if that authority is there, then then I think the uh, the government could set up a uh, an enterprise. And how is the, how are those fees determined? Well, what happens is, and it's typically done by by an expert, uh, because and it's done by experts, or you know, as long as there's enough money involved, done by experts in order to avoid litigation, because litigation can be really expensive, uh, both in terms of attorneys' fees as well as paying judgments and so forth. But the expert will look at what the anticipated cash flow is. In other words, the revenue flow, look at the potential or the, the likely expenses that will be incurred for, for, for personnel, uh, office space, equipment, and so forth, uh, and try to match those things as closely as possible. It doesn't have to be you know a, a precise dollar for dollar thing, but certainly proportional and uh, and uh, you, you know using your best judgment, looking at your crystal ball and, and uh, looking at the future. Okay. Are the terms intergovernmental agreement and interlocal agreement the same? Yeah, same thing, same thing. And, it, and I think they're referred to in some statutes as one thing, other statutes as another thing. And it varies around the, around the country and what, what uh, the phraseology is. Okay. Uh, we are a village in a township and the township does all of our parks and rec. And we're currently working on an agreement uh, you said uh, that each community on its own must be legally authorized to provide the service. Uh, the village does not have a parks and rec department. Does that mean we cannot have an interlocal agreement? Oh, no. I'm sorry if I, if I, uh, please forgive me if I didn't make that clear. It's really legal authority. So if the village has the legal authority to set up a parks and rec department, which I'm sure it does, uh, I, I mean, I'm almost positive they would, uh, then they can enter into the intergovernmental agreement to do it. Okay, so that's, this kind of answers this question. Then a follow-up was, do we then do an interlocal or intergovernmental agreement between a village and a township for the township to handle parks and rec? I think you just answered that. Yeah, yeah, and that's, and that's permissible. I mean, I'm almost positive that, that whether you have a general law village or, or uh, or a, a home rule village, you're going to have authority to do parks and rec. Okay. Then uh, one final question uh, relative to special assessments, back to proposal A's impact. Um, are you seeing any impact on special assessments relative to fairness claims uh, where you have an owner who has been a property owner for 30, 35 years uh, versus a brand new owner and the differential in their underlying tax uh, burden? Um, well, now here's, here's the important thing about special assessments is, is there's no relationship between a capping or anything like that for special assessments. It's, it's how much, how much value is the project can add to that property? So, uh, and, and, and of course that can be burdensome. There's no question. And I think the statute actually has a, a provision in it for uh, making a making an application or petition for some financial relief that uh, you know in terms of of paying for those assessments, uh, which would then require the local government, I believe, to step in and pay the assessments uh, and then collect them when the property is sold. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, Jerry, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, so again, excellent presentation. If you want to go to the next slide, we can uh, remind people of the next session. Sure. Uh, which will be September 14th, same time, uh, 12 noon till one o'clock. And then in your next slide, Jerry, if they have contact information for you. Okay. Yeah, please uh, do not hesitate to make contact. If I can uh, clarify something um, that you haven't thought of previously. All right. Well, thank you very much again, Jerry. Uh, great job. Thank uh, you. Ryan, My any, pleasure. All right. Ryan, any pleasure. final thoughts? Pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, and I can tell you that Jim and Ryan do a fantastic job over there at the county. You're muted there, Ryan. Yes, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you. Thanks, Jerry, again, and, and look forward to seeing you all again on September 14th.